Christmas is for love. It is for joy, for giving and sharing, for laughter, for faith, and for reuniting, reuniting with family and friends. But mostly, Christmas is for love. I had not believed this until a small, elfin-like pupil with wide, innocent eyes and soft, rosy cheeks gave me a wondrous gift one Christmas. Matthew was a 10-year-old orphan who lived with his aunt, a bitter, middle-aged woman greatly annoyed with the burden of caring for her dead sister's son. She never failed to remind young Matthew that if it hadn't been for her generosity, he would be a vagrant homeless stray. Still, with all the scolding and chilliness at home, he was a sweet and gentle child. I had not noticed Matthew particularly until he began staying after class each day at the risk of arousing his aunt's anger. So I learned later to help me straighten up the room. We did this quietly and comfortably, not speaking much, but enjoying the solitude of that hour of the day. When we did talk, Matthew spoke mostly of his mother. Though he was quite young when she died, he remembered a kind, gentle, loving woman who always spent time with him. As Christmas drew near, however, Matthew failed to stay after school each day. I looked forward to his coming, and when the days passed and he continued to scamper hurriedly from the room after class, I stopped him one afternoon and asked him why he no longer helped me in the room. I told him I had missed him, and his large brown eyes lit up eagerly as he replied, Did you really miss me? I explained how he had been my best helper. I was making you a surprise, he whispered confidentially. It's for Christmas. With that, he became embarrassed and dashed from the room. He didn't stay after school anymore after that. Finally, came the last school day before Christmas. Matthew crept slowly into the room late that afternoon with his hands concealing something behind his back. I have your present, he said timidly when I looked up. I hope you like it. He held out his hands, and there lying in his small palms was a little wooden box. It's beautiful, Matthew. Is there something in it? I asked, opening, uh, opening the top to look inside. Oh, you can't see what's in it, he replied, and you can't touch it or taste it or feel it. But Mother always said it makes you feel good all the time, warm on cold nights and safe when you're all alone. I gazed into the empty box. What is it, Matthew? I asked gently. That will make me feel so good. It's love, he whispered softly. And Mother always said, it's best when you give it away. So I'm giving you mine. He turned and quietly left the room. So now I keep a small box, crudely made of scraps of wood on the piano in my living room, and only smile when inquiring friends raise quizzical eyebrows when I explain to them that there's love in it. Yes, Christmas is for happiness, singing, and gifts, but mostly Christmas is for love, love for each other, love for the Lord Jesus, and remembering his great love for us. Thank you.
Christmas Bells, Henry Lawnsworth Longfellow. I heard the bells on Christmas Day, their old familiar carols play. And wild and sweet, the words repeat of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And though now, as the day had come, the belfries of all Christendom had rolled along the unbroken song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Till ringing, singing on its way, the world resolved from night to day. A voice, a chime, a chant sublime of peace on earth, goodwill to men. And in despair I hang my head. There's no peace on earth, I said. I hate the song that mocks this song of peace on earth, goodwill to men. Then peal the bells more loud and deep. God is not dead, nor does he sleep. The wrong shall fail, the right prevail, when peace on earth, goodwill to men. A Christmas alphabet. A is for angels appearing so bright, telling of Jesus that first Christmas night. B is for Bethlehem, crowded and old, birthplace of Jesus by prophet foretold. C is for cattle, their manger his bed, there in the trough he laid his head. D is for David and his ancient throne, promised forever to Jesus alone. E is for East, where shone the bright star, which magi on camels followed afar. F. F is for frankincense, with mirth and gold, brought by the wise men, as Matthew foretold. G is for God, who from heaven above sent down to mankind the son of his love. H is for Herod, whose murderous scheme was told to Joseph in a nocturnal dream. I is for Emmanuel, God with us, for Christ brought man back to the Father's house. J is for Joseph, so noble and just, obeying God's word with absolute trust. K is for king, a true king he would be, coming in power and authority. L is for love, that he brought down to earth, God enfleshed in his whole lowly birth. M is for Mary, his mother so brave, counting God faithful and mighty to save. 
and is for night when the Savior was born, for nations of earth and people forlorn. O is for Omega, meaning the last, his eternal, present, future, and past. He is for prophets when living on earth, foretold his redemption and blessed birth. Q is for quickly as shepherds who heard, hastened to act on that heavenly word. R is for rejoice. The sorrow of sin is banished forever when Jesus comes in. S is for Savior. To be this he came. The angel of God is also his name. T is for tidings of joy, not danger, telling of him who laid in a manger. U is for us, to whom Jesus was given, to show us the way and take us to heaven. V is for virgin, foretold by the sage, God's revelation on prophecy's page. W is for wonderful, his works and his words the King of all kings and Lord of all lords. X is for Christ. It's X in the Greek. Anointed, Messiah, mighty, yet meek. Y is for yes, called God's yes in his word, God's answer to all as Jesus the Lord. Z is for zeal as it burned in Christ's heart. Lord, by thy spirit, to us zeal in part.
If you look for me at Christmas, author unknown, but pay attention to who it's signed by. If you look for me at Christmas, you won't need a special star. I'm no longer in Bethlehem. I'm right here where you are. You may not be aware of me amid the, all the celebration. You'll have to look beyond the stores and all of the decorations. But if you take a moment from your list of things to do and listen to your heart, you'll find I'm waiting here for you. You're the one I want to be with. You're the reason that I came. And you'll find me in the stillness as I'm whispering your name. Love, Jesus. Luke chapter 2, beginning in verse 9. It tells us, And behold, the angel of the Lord stood before them, and the glory of the Lord shone around them, and they were greatly afraid. Then the angel said to them, Do not be afraid, for behold, I bring you good tidings of great joy, which shall be to all people. For there is born to you this day in the city of David a Savior, who is Christ the Lord. And this will be the sign to you. You will find a babe wrapped in swaddling cloths, lying in a manger. Why was Jesus born? Several reasons that scripture talks about. One of them is, he came to show us the Father. Uh, Philip was asking Jesus in John 14, show us the Father. And Jesus said, uh, he who has seen me has seen the Father. Jesus is Emmanuel, God with us, showing us what God is like. And in 1 John 2, 6, it also tells us that he gave us an example that we should walk as he walked. An example of victorious, obedient, dependent, trusting walk with God. In Hebrews 2.9, it tells us, he came that he might taste death for everyone. He is the propitiation, the one who pays the penalty for our sins, the one who died our death so that we can live. At his birth, Gabriel announced to the shepherds that Jesus was born, and uh, we know that it was Gabriel by looking at uh, Desire of Ages, page 99, as well as page 780, which clarifies that it was indeed Gabriel who was the, the announcer uh, to the shepherds. He showed up first because the glory of the choir that was going to follow was going to be so intense, they would not uh, have appreciated it if they hadn't had time to grow, grow accustomed to that glory as they were uh, beginning the process. And so Gabriel showed up first in part to give them a chance to uh, calm down in the presence of that glory. He said the babe is going to be wrapped in swaddling cloths lying in a manger. Now that is not what any Jewish person would have expected. Messiah being the great ruler they would have expected him to come in royal dignity. Instead, he came as a very poor child, uh, wrapped in swaddling clothes as the poorest of the poor, and lying in a manger, no palace here for him. Uh, he kind of snuck in uh, and uh, came incognito to our world. Not as they would have expected, but now Gabriel has told them where to find him in the city of David, how to find him lying in a manger wrapped in swaddling clothes. You will recognize him that way when you see him. And then verse 13 of Luke 2. And suddenly there was with the angel a multitude of the heavenly hosts praising God and saying, Glory to God in the highest and on earth peace, goodwill toward men. Their announcement, uh, the paraphrase of the law actually, glory to God in the highest, the first four commands, 
peace on earth, goodwill toward men, the last six. The angels sang that song uh, and then disappeared off into the night and the shepherds went to see the sight. The picture of Jesus' birth is one that has a side to it that we might not recognize easily in our culture. Gabriel had announced and the angels had sung of the birth of Jesus. The baby himself uh, would have been washed and rubbed with oil, wrapped in swaddling cloths, strips of cloth. He would have looked a little bit like a miniature mummy when they got done. And he was laid in a stone manger because there was no room in the inn. They were out in the area where the animals were. That stone manger uh, is the most likely that it was. I know in my family there's stories of the visiting relatives with the little baby and they put the baby in an emptied dresser drawer because they didn't have anything else to put the baby in. You use what you have available and so they did for Jesus. They put him in the manger. A stone trough, probably, uh, that they would have fed the animals from. In those days, a stable might very likely have been uh, a cave or grotto carved into the hillside. The traditional place of Jesus' birth in Bethlehem is a, a grotto carved out of the stone. The archaeologist uh, at seminary when I was there uh, gave us the word semi-troglodytic. A troglodyte it comes from trolls, they, and troglodytic means ones that live in caves. Semi-troglodytic is the lifestyle of many people in Palestine in the era. They had houses that were not caves, mostly, but they also used caves. Caves for the animals, caves for storage. Turns out caves are warmer in the winter and cooler in the summer when you don't have uh, modern heating and air conditioning, they had advantages in both of those seasons. And so a lot of people used holes in the hillside as part of their living arrangements. And they were there for semi-troglodytic. Now, when we come to the other end of Jesus' life, at his death, uh, he was buried in a hole in the hillside, uh, a tomb carved out of the rock, and laid in a stone trough. The garden tomb in Jerusalem, one of the traditional spots of Jesus' burial, is that form of a, of a shallow stone trough where the body would have been laid. He was wrapped in linen strips after being embalmed with oils. Uh, and all of that is a parallel to what happened when he was born. And then after his uh, uh, time in the tomb over the weekend on Sunday morning, Gabriel returned to call him forth from the tomb. And the angels sang in celebration of his resurrection. And so at the birth of Jesus, we have the picture of a baby wrapped up like a miniature mummy laid in a stone trough like a miniature grave in a hole in the hillside like a miniature tomb. Jesus, by the picture of his birth, was born to die. He was born to die so that he could taste death for every man so that we might live. And then we too must die. Uh, Galatians 2.20 says, I am crucified with Christ. Nevertheless, I live, yet not I, but Christ liveth in me. We must be crucified with Christ so that we might live as well. So when you think of Jesus uh, in the manger, uh, in the stable, remember that that was a picture uh, that mirrored the circumstances of his later burial, and it was something of, of a, a prophetic image of what his life was going to lead to, his death for our sins. God bless.